came quick, y'all. <laughs> you know, it happened every so often, but it came quick. I don't think May ever got here from November as fast as it did. Because I've had this since November. Okay, so we're going to pray. Anisha did a great job, and I appreciate her for that. But just to further calm my nerves, we're going to do this. And I was not nervous until I just walked in here. You would think I don't know y'all, but I done seen all y'all every day for the past 10 years. <laughs> I'm still nervous. Right. So, hey, Anthony, how are you? Okay, I'm good. Okay. So, dear Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you just for being you, God. Thank you for loving me and all of us in spite of ourselves, God. Thank you for coming into our hearts. Thank you for taking a residence there. Thank you for just being a calming spirit in a time of storms, God. I ask for you just to help. Again, like Anisha said, me decrease so that you may increase, so that the lesson that you gave me, I can give to everybody else. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so today's lesson is obedience in the Messiah. Um, just a moment of transparency, I always struggle with teaching, whether I'm teaching my kids or in front of everybody, because I feel like to be a teacher, you have to be an expert on a subject, but... God told me, and I swear he just told me this the other day, not even when I had this lesson, but his word is the only thing you can teach and learn at the same time. Amen. You don't have to be an expert. You're not required to be an expert. You're only required to give what he gave to you. Right. And so that helped calm me a whole lot because I'm like, okay, you want me to teach on obedience? I don't listen, God. <laughs> you know me. I don't listen. <laughs> But I needed this to help me listen. And so I needed this lesson to help teach me that I am okay asking him to help me in this area. And so um, our outlines are Luke 5, 1 and 7, Luke 5, 8 through 10, and Luke 5 through 11. So our first one is Jesus teaches his disciples. The second outline is Jesus cleanses his disciples. And the third is Jesus leads his disciples. That's in our in the children's book, or my kids' book. In our, in the adult book, it's called, disciples are called to act in faith, disciples are stirred to confess in faith, and disciples are invited to follow in faith. So, obedience, it simply means to hear a command and act on it. And biblical obedience means to hear, trust, submit, and surrender to God's word. Sounds simple, right? Yeah, it does, but... <laughs> you would think so. So I said, I'm not about to sit up here and act like I am have an immaculate track record in doing what it says and obeying God. But like I said, this lesson had me asking God to help me with my willingness to let go of myself and obey his word. And asking myself, why is it so hard to do so when all I know that he wants for me is the abundant life that he promised? And it gave me a desire to do better, and I hope it does the same for you. And I have to say that I wanted to say it's because it's any other reason besides not trusting, but that's just what it is. And I had to tell myself that and ask myself, well, why don't you trust? And we were in class yesterday, and it comes back to we've gotten so used to just trusting ourselves because other people have let us down along the way. But we have to learn that we can't become too independent that we don't depend on God because that's not what he wants. He wants us to constantly depend on him, and that's what he's there for. It's not for us to get too strong to where we don't need him no more. No, he teaches us to depend, to depend more on him, not to depend less on him as he's teaching us his word. So Deuteronomy 11, 26 to 28 simply says, obey and you'll be blessed. Disobey and you'll be cursed. It's just as simple as that. O obey and you'll be blessed. Disobey and you'll be cursed. The curse is just whatever it's going to be. It doesn't have to necessarily be you're going to be cursed to be damned to do all these things, but curse just simply means you're not blessed. You're not getting what he has for you. So that's where the curse comes in. And them is God's words, not mine. So he didn't miss the words. He didn't put them in a riddle or a parable. He said it just like he meant it. Obey and you'll be blessed. Disobey and you'll be cursed. And so today we'll learn the three things we as disciples of Christ are called to exercise. So the first outline again is disciples are called 
to act in faith. So in Luke 1, 5, 1 through 7, it says, as the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear God's word, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. He saw two boats on the edge of the lake. The fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. So they were done for the day. They were putting up everything. They were done. They were getting ready to go home. So here comes Jesus. He got into one of the boats, which belonged to Simon, and asked him to put out a little, a little bit from the land. So that was the first thing he asked Simon to do, to pull him out a little bit from the land. And then he said, um, he, then he sat down and was teaching the crowds from the boat. And when he finished speaking, second thing he asked Simon to do, pull out into the deep waters and let down your nets for the catch. Uh -huh. Simon said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. But if you say so, if you say so, I'll let down the nets. And that's only because he said so. He had just saw what Jesus did to his mother-in-law. So he knew his track record of being a healer. So he knew what he could do. So that's why he knew that he could obey him and do what was going to be done. Even though Jesus was a carpenter and Simon was a fisherman. He knew he didn't know much about fishing. But he trusted him because he had saw what he had done already. So it says, when they did this, they, thought they caught a great number of fish and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. Then they came and filled the boats and they began to sink again. So acting in faith is, faith is needed because faith without works is what? Yeah. It is. You have to do something. We can say we have faith all day long, but until we do something about it, it's dead. So acting on something or activating means what? To so use said thing. So like, again, we must use our faith for it to work. We can claim to have it. We can swear we have it. We can put it on 10 stacks of Bibles that we have it. But if we don't show to have, it, to have action behind it, then it means nothing. It says another word for obey in the New Testament is trust. You don't trust what you don't obey. You don't obey what you don't trust. So they go hand in hand. It just is what it is. You don't follow who you don't obey. You don't trust who you don't follow. It just goes hand in hand. So it's safe to say that we are not obeying God's word because why? We don't fully trust him. It just is what it is. I had to let that set up my spirit and be like, man, man, you got to do better. Because that one, that one hurt. I ain't going to lie. Because I say I trust him. I say I do all day long and twice on Sunday. But if I'm not following and walking in the way that he tells me to, what does that show? What does that show? What does my life depict? It don't depict that I'm trusting him at all, at all. So, and we have to trust him. And if you're like me, you trust him a little bit in certain areas or a lot in certain areas. But in this area over here now, I got that, God. Don't worry about it. I got that one. This over here, I believe you wholeheartedly. You got it all. You know what's best for me. But this over here, mm -mm, you don't know nothing about that. We're going to go blow for blow about this one because I don't think you know what you're talking about. I know better. I didn't create myself, but I know better over here, God. Yeah. No, that's not. <laughs> that's how we do, though. That is how we do. You're going to go blow to blow, blow to blow for the orchestrator of your life. Well, amen. Cause that's what I, I told myself that. Well, amen. But you can't. What is the first step in, what is it, the 12-step program? You cannot get help unless you admit you have a problem. So that's where it was. So we are called to act because he also wants to know that he can trust us. He wants to know that we're going to do our part. He's gone before us, and he knows where our life is going to be. But he's not just going to give it to us. It don't work that way. You have to work for what you want. Because if somebody gives it to you, it's too easy. Easy is sleazy. You don't want that. You got you to put some work into it. You got to put some work into it because anybody who knows if you give somebody something, they don't appreciate it. These kids don't appreciate nothing you give them. If they work for it, they'll appreciate it harder. When they get a job and work for the shoes they get, I promise you they'll keep them clean. When they get a job and work for the car that they get, they, I promise you they'll keep it clean. But if you give it to them, they're going to do whatever they want so they feel like another one will come. My daddy gave TT a car. Y'all know Betty. I got in bed one day, and I was mad. Run me them keys, because no, ma'am, this is not what we do. He gave you this. You don't have a car note. You don't have to do anything to it but take care of it. And when I got in it, it like a tornado hit it. No, ma'am, that's not what we do. You have to say, but that one she got now, 
Baby, you better not drop a crumb. You got vacuum cleaning it. She washing the window. She doing all of that. Why? Because she pays for it herself. So the life that he wants us to have, we have to earn it. We have to pay for it. We've got to put some skin in the game. We don't just have to pay money for it, but we have to put something in. Our faith is the money. It's the currency to God. Our obedience is the currency to God. So we have to give him something in order for us to get that life, y'all. So we'll know to appreciate it. So we'll know to appreciate it. So he's not just out here passing out abundance for us to squander it. Because then that just makes his name look bad. He can't just give us stuff, and then we just go over there and just throw it to the wayside. Like, oh, he'll give me some more. He'll give me some more. He'll give me some more. No, that's not how it works. Yes, he gives us his grace. Yes, he gives us his mercy. But we can't take that for granted. We can't take it for granted at all. And he wants to know that we're willing to do our part in the trust and move, like Abraham. Did we learn about Abraham? That's a perfect example, to trust and move. He didn't know where God wanted him to go. He didn't know God told him to move. Now, he did his own extras in that, like we do. Took folks that weren't supposed to go, you know, was wondering and this, that, and the other. But he ultimately did what God told him to do. So even when we don't wholeheartedly do what he tells us to do, even with a little bit of it, he st- his blessings are still going to be there. Because even in knowing some things that he wants us to do, they don't always connect with us. Because in our minds, we would never do that in ourselves. God be having us out here doing the craziest stuff. The craziest things. And you be like, this God, this one. Give money to this one, you know they ain't got no job. But you want me to give my money that I work for to them and they can't pay it back. Okay, show you right. Call this one knowing, knowing what it was, what it done being, and probably, if you're not in it, what it's going to be. But he tell you to do it anyway. Why? Because there's a blessing on the other line, on the other side of that, either for you or the person he told you to call. So he wants you to do so. Um, he wants you to leave a great job. Great job, benefits, this, that, and the other hours are good, this, that, and to start your own business. To start your own business. <sighs> that part. He wants you to do that. It will have everybody else scratching their heads. But that's how you know it's God. You too, for sure. But that's how you know it's him. Because, yeah, that one right there, God, you sure? Okay, well, it's it's on you. If you told me to do this, it's on you. And we have to understand that when he tells us to do something, it's on him. It's not on us. If we follow what he tells us to do, it's on him. So all of these requests may look crazy to other people as well as ourselves, but our faith grows from obedience. And some requests require, require more faith than others. God will test our willingness to obey him with small requests like he asked Simon to pull out the boat. That's a small request. Before he requests, before he asks us to do bigger things, and in this case, the bigger thing was putting out the nets. I mean, they was done for the day. They had washed up everything. They were done. They were satisfied with what they caught, if anything, and they were ready to go home and leave it at that. He's not going to give us the big blessings if he can't trust us to move in the small things that he asks us to do. We have to understand that for sure. Because we can't get to the big stuff until we go through the small stuff. So the book says Jesus' commands indeed, Jesus' commands indeed to commit the scripture as a whole may seem unwise or counterintuitive to us, but they are worthy of his obedience nonetheless. Because his obedience is where our blessings come from. You are not blessed if you don't obey. I don't think any of us is this age or the big age that we are now know that if you don't obey, what's going to happen? But if, you, but if you do obey, you also get consequences, but they're good consequences. It's just the same. You're going to have a consequence either way, one or the other. One or the other. So either it's going to be good or it's going to be not so good. It just is what it is. So... Um, while God be having us out there looking crazy good and the person in the sauna with a fur coat on, it still is what it is. It still is what it is. And to me, the crazier the request, the bigger the blessing. The more foolish, the more the more foolish it seems, the it's the bigger lesson for him to show us. It's the bigger, you know, so we can so he can get the glory out of it. Because that's all it's for. Our obedience is for us to get the, or us to get the abundance, or us to get the lesson, and for Him to get the glory. That's it. That's all. So, in our C 
second outline, um, after he, you know, showed Simon, he pulled down his net, they pulled up the fish, and they saw how many it was. Simon immediately felt a certain way. He felt like that he just was not blessed enough to be in the, in the presence of God. He felt like he was just not good enough because he knew, you know, who Jesus was. Now, like I said before, he had just saw him heal his mother-in-law, so he knew what he did for somebody else. He saw what he did for somebody else. So that's what made him obey him. But once he saw what he did for him, that made him confess. Because it happened in his life. We can all day long and see what God does for other people, but until he does it for us, that's when we for sure know, you know, or for sure feel some type of way. Like, God, I don't know if I deserve that. But I'm here to tell you, you do. Just like the other person. Just like he, he deserved for his, him to move in his mother-in-law's life, we deserve for him to move in our life as well. So our second one says, as the crowd was pressing, no, that's our first one. Let me go to the second one. It says, Master Simon replied, we worked all night and caught nothing. Um, but if you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they did this, they caught a great number of fish, and their nets began to tear. So that's a lot of fish. Now, these boats and these fish, these men were fishermen by trade. So I'm assuming they had the best of the best. So you had to know how many it was for the net to tear. God don't do nothing little. When he won't, big God. So we had, a, I'm talking about a lot of fish. So for them to tear. So it says, so they signal to their partners. Okay, so I got a lot. Y'all come on and get some of this. Because that's what it does. It's overflow. Come on and get some of this. Come on and get some of this to come help them. And they came and filled their boats. It's so full they begin to sink. These are boats. You know how many fish it had to be for the boats to sink? The boats to sink. Think about that. That's how much abundance he wants us to have. For our boats to start sinking, that's how much abundance he wants us to have. So it says, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell to Jesus' knees. He fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me because I am a sinful man, Lord. He felt like his sin would keep him from, should keep him from being in Jesus' presence, just like us. But it's not true. It's not true. That's what he wants. He wants us to be able to come to him just the way we are, just the way we are. So it says, um, stirred means to arouse or prompt a feeling or memory or inspire. Simon was prompted to confess his unworthiness to Jesus after seeing the miracle, miracle Jesus performed right before everyone's eyes. Yeah. I mean, Simon knew it couldn't have been nothing, nothing but God to produce all of those fish. He was a fisherman by trade, so I imagine he knew the waters like the back of his hand. He'd been out there every day, all day. This is what he did, and he caught nothing. Yeah. The text don't say this, but I imagine that God made it that way because he knew Jesus was coming. Yeah. So he made him not catch nothing that night before because he knew the request that Jesus was going to have for Simon. And he knew what he had to show them. If they had a caught anything, you know, he probably wouldn't have said, all right, you know, we done been out here all night, but okay, I'll do it anyway. He probably wouldn't have said that because he knew he would have caught some more because he knew they were there already. So it says, um, so when they obeyed, they knew it was all God. So us in business, us at work, don't Count yourself out because you're doing all you can in your business and it's not producing right now. Because in a minute, God is going to give you an overflow to where our nets will break. He's going to give you what you're asking for because you put the work in. So don't get upset about that because it's coming. It's coming soon enough. It's coming soon enough. And when he shows up, he's going to do his thing. It's going to be so big and it's going to break. going to have enough for everybody. Everybody, everybody, everybody. He knows all he's seen is being done. The faith is being built is when the floodgates open, it's going to be enough to feed you and everybody associated with you. We see what happened in this story. It says the catch was so big they had to call the other boats. But when we obey God, it not only helps us, but everybody around us too. That's how you know that you're doing what God wanted you to do because there's enough to feed the overflow. There's enough for everybody to have a little bit of it. You, it's, a, it's just like with Carla. She has a contract that she did with DISD, but there's enough for her to come in and ask, well, hey, Maymay, can you help me out with this, that, and other? That way we all get to, you know, eat, and we all get to do this, that, and the other. That's how you know you're obeying God. Everybody gets to eat. Everybody gets to eat. So when Simon just saw what Jesus had done, his spiritual eye opened, and he instantly felt unworthy. Why? Because he was in the presence of perfection. 
He knew it, so he demonstrated his submission to Jesus by throwing himself at Jesus' feet and declaring him Lord. It's one thing to declare him our Savior, to save us. When we call him Lord, that means that's something totally different. That's totally different. That's totally different. So, with all this, God wants our obedience for our abundance. And he promised his children that so he could get the glory out of it, for sure. For sure. So, it says, the commands of God may be beyond our understanding, but they carry authority and wisdom of Christ, our creator and our sustainer. He knows. So, he's not going to ask you something that he don't know the outcome of. He's not going to ask you to do something that he don't already know is going to work in your favor. He don't ask us to go out here and just do stuff to make him look bad. Because if it don't work, it's going to look bad on him. And that way we're not going to be able to confess and testify that God did this for me. That's not going to win nobody to his kingdom. So if he asks you to do it, just know that on the other end of it, it's going to be his glory. It's going to be your lesson. You're going to get something great out of it. It's not our job to worry about the journey. We can't worry about the journey. That's what stops us from doing what he tells us to do because we're so worried about the particulars. Well, God, you want me to take five steps up? Is it going to be somewhere for me to fall? Oh, you want me to take two steps to the left? Is it going to be somewhere to block me? Well, who all going to be there, God? Who all going to be there when I get there? Or who, who am I going to encounter along the way? Somebody going to stop me? Is somebody going to keep me from doing this? That's not what he asked you to do. All that's going to be there. Let me, let me stop you right there. All of that's going to be there. It's going to be haters. It's going to be doubters. It's going to be the enemies. It's going to be people who say you can't do it. It's going to be people that ask you, why are you doing that? That looks funny. I wouldn't have done that if I was you. Well, you ain't me. And you don't know the conversation I had with God. So we'll leave it at that. I'm going to do what he told me to do, and you just, you know, keep doing that. And we'll see how it work out at the end of the day. But I promise you, if we do what he tells us to do, we'll have something to say at the end that's going to be magnificent. And them same people who doubted it, will pop say, going to be like, I knew you could do it. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. So when encountering the holiness of Jesus, the Son of God, a true faith leads us to submission and acknowledgement and repentance of sin. It leads us to that. We should want to. Just because what he's given us beforehand, what he gave us when we weren't even thinking about him, should make us want to give him more now that we are. Now that we are. Now that we are. It really should. It honestly should. So, um, the miraculous act of God stops Simon Peter in his tracks, which often it does. When we see things that God does for us, it should stop us in our tracks in awe. And magnificent, just referencing him right then and there. I'm talking about from the small stuff to the big stuff. It don't matter. When I find a parking spot at Walmart, I'm thanking God. I'm telling you, I am not lying. My kids probably think I'm crazy. Thank you, Lord. Because do you know how hard parking spots is good? No, for real, honestly. So it says, um, he, respond, he rightly responded to the glory of Jesus with repentance and humility which is what we should, humility to show God, God, I know I'm not worthy, but I thank you anyway. I know, and I hate to say the word don't deserve, because he tells us we do deserve it, but it's just a feeling of us as we should. We, we should, and we have to understand that we are worthy of it. We are worthy of his love. We are worthy of his blessings. We are worthy of his, you know, just everything that he has to come with us, but we just have to give the faith in it. We just have to show you know, the work that we've done in it. And so it says, it is. But this first act of worship was just starting, was just a starting point for following Jesus. So just him seeing this, it just goes to when we, when he teaches, he has to show us because he knows we're human. We, he knows we can see on the human eyes. So he can teach a lesson, but like Pastor I always say, he shows us in living color right then and there. So he has to show them in living color right then and there. So I'm assuming he's teaching on obedience. He don't say what he was teaching on. But I'm assuming he's teaching on obedience because he asked him to do something and he did it and it showed the, it showed the what's the word I'm looking for? The outcome of when you obey God right then and there. It didn't say go do this and in two days the fish came. No, 
It said, it didn't even say 20 seconds after. It said as soon as he put them nets in there, the fish came and broke the net. So as soon as. So he had already orchestrated that. Like, he can rule anything to come to us. All we have to do is follow and obey. That's it. So if he could command all of these fish to come in, not break, how many boats? Three boats. Not break one net, not two, but three? That's a lot of fish. That's a lot of abundance. That's a lot. He had to show them big. It could not be a small fish. He had to show them big. So we have plenty of examples of, you know, obedience. We're learning about Abraham. And if we listen to obedience, we can go all the way back to Mary and Joseph. Think about it. When they was pregnant with Jesus at the beginning, you had to obey that. This little girl, she was pregnant. And she was like, well, God, I ain't done nothing, but I'm pregnant. So you got to tell me what to do in this matter because I don't know. And then you got, you got um, Pope Joseph over here <laughs> that he don't know what to do with none of it. He like, okay, I like her now. But uh, she cool and all. But do you know what these people going to say about me when I show up with her pregnant and we ain't even done nothing? I'm going to need you to come tell me what to do right now. But as the angels appeared to both of them and calmed their nerves, they was able to walk and obey in it. And we got Jesus out the whole thing. So by them walking and obeying, here it go again. You walk and obey, your people around you are going to be blessed. They walked and obeyed, the whole world was blessed. The whole world was blessed at the end of the day. The whole world was blessed. And then the ultimate in obedience, Jesus himself, the ultimate obedience, he came down and did a job that none of us could do. He came down and obeyed something that was that's tough. Like he came and died for people who could care less about him at the end of the day because we're doing our own thing. They were doing their own thing, but he still knew that he had to do something. Thank you. Because he had to do something in order to, in order to keep to save us, because that's what his father needed. He wanted and desired a relationship with his creation, so he had to do the job himself. And so he came down and he did it. Now he could have at any moment said no because the angels was waiting. They were waiting on him to say something, and he still obeyed until the end. So we have a lot of examples of what God's obedience will give us in this Bible. It's going to give you life. It's going to give you a way. It's going to give you just everything you need in order to keep going on with this life. It is. It is. We have, oh, let me see. Let me see, let me see, let me see. There was a part in here that I underlined. I should have highlighted it, but... It's all right. Okay. Faithful obedience places the authority and sovereignty over Christ, over the proficiency and the experience of the expert. It kind of goes back to what I said at the beginning. You don't have to be an expert to teach God's word. You just have to be willing, and you have to be obedient, and you have to just pick it up so you can learn it yourself. And in learning it yourself is how you are helping to give it to other people. So you don't have to be an expert. Most times you do, but you do not in this aspect. And it says, even if what meets the eye is beyond our understanding. A lot of what he asks us to do is beyond our understanding. Me standing up here before y'all right now is beyond my understanding. When Pastor asked me to teach Sunday school, it was beyond my understanding. But I also I always go back to this. As a little girl, I always want to be a teacher. Always. When I was in kindergarten and met my kindergarten teacher, my second one, the first one reminded me of the old lady from Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, and I didn't want to go back to school. But, no, that lady was old, y'all. She was old. Her name was Miss Sword. You know what a name like that you mean. She was old. And I told my mama, I don't want to go back to school. I don't want to go back to school. I don't want to go back to school. But something happened to the lady. I don't know if Jesus took her out. I don't know if God took her out. I don't know what happened. But I went back to school another week. <laughs> she had, she was 105, y'all. I'm not joking. That lady was old. And she was old. But I'm going to tell you how he worked even at that age. I went back to school the following week, and it's like a rainbow had appeared. The whole classroom was covered. We went in class with her like prison. Like there was nothing on the walls. We were sitting in jail. Now, I don't know if this is my kindergarten six-year-old brain that was telling me this, but that's what it felt like. But when I went back to school, I had a teacher named Ms. Rasdale. 
She looks like the lady from the Magic School Bus with the red hair, Miss Frizzle. That's what she reminded me. She had red hair, and all the walls were covered. We had colors everywhere. We had this, and that would make me want to be a teacher. But then fast forward to sixth grade, and they made the teacher cry on the first day of school. I said, absolutely not. We not doing this because Jesus, I will go to jail. So we're going to figure out something else. But back then, I didn't know you could teach elementary school, you could teach secondary school, you could teach high school. I didn't know. But that's where it came from. I always wanted to be a teacher because I just always thought that that was the most magnificent job to have. You know? And so I'm not teaching students, but he knew what I wanted to do, and here I am. It's still beyond my understanding, but it is what it is. And so that's what I go back to because I said I want to be a teacher. I never said what type of teacher, but he has me teaching for what it's worth. So in that, our third outline is disciples are invited to follow Christ. It's an invitation. He's not going to force you. He's a willing God. He has to know that you accept it. But anything we make somebody do, we don't know if they really want to do it or not. But if we accept it, then that puts some, something back on us. Well, you accepted it, so what you going to do with it? You didn't have to. You could have stayed right where you were. But since you didn't, what are we going to do with it? What are you going to do? How are you going to act? It's, we shouldn't accept something if we're not going to use it. We shouldn't accept something if we're not going to act on it. What's the point of accepting it if we don't act on what comes with the acceptance? What's the point of accepting it if we don't walk in the faith? What's the point of accepting it if we don't exercise the faith? What's the point of accepting it if we don't accept his grace and mercy? What's the point of accepting it if we don't forgive ourselves? What's the point of accepting it if we going to still act the same way that we were did before we accepted it? What is the point? We could have just stayed where we were until we were ready to accept it. Even though we're not fully where we should be, the fact that we were willing to accept it invites him in to help us. So we got to take the help. You can't ask somebody for help and be like, nah, never mind, I don't want the help. We got to take the help to get us better. Perfect, we won't. But we got to take the help to get us to where he wants us to be. So, in that line three, we're on Luke 5, 9 and, one, 9 and 11. It says, for he and all those were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. Now, mind you, they were out there, like I said before. They put everything up. They was done for. They was ready to go home. I imagine they were defeated. I imagine their spirits was crazy. They was trying to figure out how they was going to feed their family, how they was going to sell, what they was going to sell for the next day. Because if they don't catch, the, none of the people eat. Like, not just their families, but the rest of the community that they sell fish to as well don't eat. So they're sitting here, you know, like, well, oh, well, we got to get up. We got to get this done. So their names were James, John, and Zeb James and John. They were Zebedee's sons who were Simon's partners. Don't be afraid, Jesus told Simon. After he threw his feet at him and told him he wasn't worthy and he, you know, wanted Jesus to depart from him because he felt like he wasn't worthy, don't be afraid. Don't be scared. Don't worry about it because now you're going to be the fisher of men. So now not only are you going to catch, you've caught these fish, you're going to catch people to bring them to our word and you're going to use exactly what I just showed you and the miracle that I showed you to help teach that, to help, them, to help bring them in with that. And so that's what he did it for because he does these miracles for us to go tell other people. It's not just, it, we benefit from it, but he tells us to go tell other people because ultimately that's what we are supposed to do as disciples, go tell other people about God's word to draw them in. We're not supposed to hoard it. We're not supposed to like, oh, yeah, God did that for me. Let me hold that over here in this bucket and keep it for myself. No, we're supposed to go out and tell people, you know what God did for me? You know what he, you know, stood up in my life and showed? And so to win other people to it, that's why he does it. So it says the call to follow Jesus comes with a commission to join in his works of sharing the gospel and salvation by Jesus Christ because that is our job. That is what we're supposed to do. The reality of who Jesus is demands a response. I underline that in the book. The, the, the reality of who he is demands a response. It calls us to do something. It calls us to say something. It, it demands us to say something, not just call. Demand is, means a little force behind it. You can ask somebody to do something, but demand means I need you to do this right now, right now, right now. So that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to get this done and tell people about him right now. Because tomorrow might be too late. The people that's assigned to you, it may be too late tomorrow. 
So you have to do it while he gives us the opportunity to do so. So it says, so now we just witness Simon fall to Jesus' feet and declare himself unworthy, which I'm sure we've all done or felt at some point. To declare to God that we're too horrible to be in his presence, too horrible for him to use us, too horrible for him to ever do a good work in us. Not today. No, not at all. And how dare we talk about his kids in his face? How dare we talk about his creations in his face? How are we going to go to God and tell God we not good enough? He created us. That's crazy. You can't do that. We shouldn't do that. We do it all the time. Don't get me wrong. But we should not. And we don't have to because he knew how he created us. He knew he created us with whatever flaws we have. He knew he created us with, with whatever, you know, I was with well, fears too, because those fears are there so he can overcome. But he knew he created us with them. They were in us when we were when we got here. So he knew that was there. And he still decided to make us. He still decided to call us. With that and all, because he knew from the from the moment we were born. So it says, how it, however, Jesus, just like a great big brother, comforted Simon and told him, Don't be afraid. Because that's what our big brothers sometimes do, our big sisters do. We'll go to them scared about something, and they'll come to us, Oh, don't be scared. You know, you don't have nothing to fear. You know, I've been there a time, you know, well, I thought this was going to happen, and it didn't happen that way. But now you don't have to worry about it because I'm with you. Beforehand, you didn't have me. I can imagine what he told them. But now you have me, so you don't have to fear about anything. It may be, you may be a little, it may be a little, trep, you may have a little trepidation, but you don't have to fear. And the first step that you take is the hardest one that you're going to ever take. The steps, they get easier. And as we all learn to obey God, he told me it will get easier. It'll get easier to do. It'll get easier to do. So it says, um, he released him from his guilt and told him that he would be a fisher of men now, using God's word and what he witnessed in his own eyes to draw people to God's side, which is what we are called to do also. We must use our own big catch moments to help bring in more fish that Jesus needs than what we have. In this scripture, yeah, our big catch moments, because we all have them. We all have them, our big catch moments. We have them in our life to be able to go out and tell somebody about God. So it says, in this scripture, we see that the others were changed by Jesus as well. Not only did Simon Peter leave anything, everything behind and follow Jesus, his homies did too. They saw it. So when you go and you tell your friends about what God did for you, that's to stir them back to God. That's to bring them back because sometimes a stranger telling you what God did for them, it don't, you don't recognize that. You don't feel that in your spirit. But if you know who your friend was and you know how your friend used to, you know, overthink everything. You know how your friend used to, you know, doubt themselves. You know how your friend used to, you know, just be in their own minds. But now they come tell you, God release me from that. I don't do that no more. I don't do that no more. I think what he tells me to think. I read his word. Is it easy? No, but I'm telling you what will, what will help me. So if I'm telling you what will help me, I know for sure it'll help you. And that's what we're supposed to do. And when that happens, it's to draw them in. Now, we're not responsible for drawing them in. That's not us. We're only responsible for telling them. God does the stir, planting the seed. God does everything, the water and the growing and all of that. We have to be guilty of doing our job. But it starts with us doing our job because that's what it's there for. If you are not able to inspire the people around you, what you there for? Or what they're around, no, better yet, what they're around you for? What they're around you for? If you can't tell them a good word and they respond to it, even if it's okay, I hear you. I'm not saying they have to get up and, you know, do it. Even if it's, I hear you. I understand. I get it. Appreciate you for telling me that. Like, if, you, if your friend is walking down a destructive path and you can't tell them, hey, mm-mm, that's not right. That's not your friend. That's not your friend. And you're not their friend. Y'all not there for each other. Get somebody else to do it. Because it's somebody else out there who is waiting. It's somebody else out there who will take it in because that's what we're supposed to. We can't keep beating our heads up against brick walls because we're going to lose. As my mom used to say, the more I tell you, the dumber I get because it's going on deaf ears. And sometimes people are just not ready at that moment, and that's okay. He'll get them ready. But you've done your part of what God told you to do to give them what he's given you in their life, and that's it. That's all you can do. That's it. That's all. 
So in this aspect, he saw it, and they saw it, and they moved at the exact same time. So they too saw the miracle of nature that Jesus performed, and they knew whatever they caught that morning was nothing compared to how they be blessed by following Jesus. So he came to teach a word, but they left to follow him. They left everything behind, their livelihood, what they knew that was that was already taking care of their families. They left it all because they knew if he could catch this many fish, what he'll do if I go follow him? What he'll bless me with if I go follow him? If I can sacrifice this little bit, but it was a lot, but it's a little bit compared to what I'll get if I keep moving with him. You know, so they, they recognize that, <clears throat> and that's what we have to do. It's one thing to read his word. It's one thing to know God, but it's something else to follow him. It's something else to follow him. Followship is different than knowing. We can know it, but if we don't follow it, we don't do nothing with it. We don't reap the benefits of it. We don't reap the blessings of it. We don't reap anything of it. So I said that to say, leave it alone. Whatever it is, leave it alone. Let it be. Leave it there. Whatever is causing you not to follow God with everything in you, like I heard him tell me, leave it alone. Because it's, it, it's a block in there somewhere. It's a block in there somewhere. So we have to recognize what that is. And if we don't, we have to ask God to help us recognize what that is. And there's nothing wrong with that. I had to learn that and learn that coming here. It's nothing wrong. That's what he's there for, to ask for help. To ask for help. Again, we cannot become too dependent on ourselves that we become we become, we don't need God, that we don't depend on him. That's what he's there for. He's not there to tell us a lesson one time and we're supposed to get it right there and there. That's not how it works sometimes. You, that's not how it works. He knows us. He knows how many times it's going to take us to do this one thing to get it right. He knows. He knows if you obey on Wednesday, you're not going to obey on Thursday. You might. He knows if you do this good, if you're good in this area, you're not good in that area. He knows. So he's there for us to ask for help. That's what he's there for. That's what he's there for. And it's going to bless our game when we learn how to do so. <clears throat> and we have to let it set in our spirits that we're not going to be, it's not, a, it's not a drive to be perfect. It's not a drive. It's not a, and it's not a swift race either. This is, it's a marathon. It's not a 20-yard dash. It's a personal marathon that we have to take. Somebody, somebody's marathon may be shorter. Somebody may have a 1K to get to where God is. You may have a 5K. The person next to you may have a 10K. We don't know how long it's going to take. But as long as we're on the path that he tells us to be on and are pressing towards him, we're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. So, in conclusion... We may not come out the gate with faith as big as, you know, as it should be, or as people say it should be. As long as we know we're going to God, as long as we know that we're asking him to help us with our... By the way, y'all, from personal experience, <laughs> God and faith, if you ask him, he's going to give you the test. He's going to give it to you. Put your seatbelt on and buckle up for the ride. Because when you ask him for something, he going to give it to you. And he's not going to give it to you how you expect it. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be simple. It's going to be in the least way that you expect it. But that's how he knows that you were serious about asking for it when you don't lose it. So understand that if it gets tough, or if something is happening, go back and ask yourself, what I ask God for? And I promise you it'll come back to you. Go back and ask God, run that conversation back, and it'll help you. Especially when you ask for something, you'll be like, okay, God, I, you know, I asked for that, but I ain't asked to lose my job, but you asked him to help you with your business. You can't do two things at once. You know, I, didn't, I asked you to help me, you know, increase my praise. I didn't ask you to take my daddy out of here, you know? But he gonna do it how he wants to because that helped me to praise him more. You get what I'm saying? That helped me to get to him more. That called me to him in order. So I had to understand just because I asked for something, he gonna give it to me how he wants to. Not how I want to because if he had to give it to me like I want to, that means I'm in control, which I'm not. I'm not at all. I'm not at all. So just understand that 
this word, it'll help you get through and your and relaying your conversations back to yourself that you have with God will help you get through. And sometimes if it's like me, if I know I asked for something, I can't get mad because he gave it to me. I asked for this. You right, God. I asked for it. So help me deal with it now. So help me deal with it now. Teach me what you're trying to teach me. Let me get what you want me to get out of it. I remember I asked for this prayer, so let me go on and give it. I remember I asked for this faith, so let me go on and exercise it. I remember I asked for this determination. I remember I asked for this help with my business, so let me go ahead and just put my head down and get it done so we can get to the other side of this thing. So we can get to the other side of it. So, um... So it says, I now understand it, that you may not come out the gate with faith, that you've shown in the scriptures above. If you did, if you came out the gate with a big old faith, I'm happy for you. I'm, I'm ecstatic for you. But I'm talking to those like myself that beat themselves up regarding it, that need a little bit of help every now and again. Every now and again. Every now and again. We got to give ourselves some grace, y'all. We got to give ourselves some grace. We have depended on ourselves and in ourselves for so long. When somebody comes and gives us a rest, we don't know how to act. We don't know how to accept it. We don't know how to settle in it. We don't know what to do with it. So we have to learn what to do with it. And we have to ask him, God, help me do what I need to do with this so that I am not misusing it so I'm not letting it go to waste so I'm not just letting it sit here without being used so it says understand um, the more we read his word his following his voice becomes easier the more we know what his word says following his voice becomes easier the more that we can recognize and like pastor I always say it's not gonna be loud it's not going to come on a loud speaker with a megaphone telling you to do this nope it's gonna come in a very very quiet voice that you can barely hear but if we in tune we will hear it so it says if we stay the course it'll become like second nature listening and following his God following God's voice Joshua 1 and 8 says keep this book of the law always on your lips and meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do what's written in it and once we do that you'll be prosperous and have good success he just told us that yesterday I swear Saturday class yesterday taught my whole lesson, which just made me understand. I swear I told them yesterday, I said, now, when y'all hear this tomorrow, understand it was already written. I already wrote this down. I promise y'all not plagiarizing what y'all just said. I already wrote this down. Y'all, y'all, y'all didn't write. I already wrote it down. But it just confirmed to me. And I got, and y'all, I got there late. I didn't get there at 6 o'clock. I got there at 7 o'clock. And so that means he held what had to be said until I got there so I could be confirmed that I was on the right vein because I had no idea. I'm like, am I saying the right thing? Is this the right thing? Is this lesson going to be, you know, go forth? But when he said it, I swear, I was sitting there in amazement. I said, okay, show you right. We're going to go ahead and say this tomorrow because it apparently is what I'm supposed to say. Because other people have not, I ain't talked to Pastor, I ain't talked to Contessa, I haven't talked to nobody, but they literally said what's in here word for word. Word for word. So that couldn't be nothing but God. So again, just like Simon, with them fish, he knew it couldn't be nothing but God. I knew it couldn't be nothing but God when I showed up in that class and they said exactly what I said on this paper. I swear to God, it couldn't be nothing but God. So he showed himself mighty to me on yesterday for sure. Um... So it says in our obedience is a visible expression of our invisible faith. So us obedient, us obeying God, nobody can nobody knows what God told us. We can tell people all day long, but nobody knows what he told us. So for us to move in faith, it's invisible for us to see, but we are showing people what he told us. And we show people what he told us, that's how they're able to see it. So I hope you all are encouraged to either keep listening and moving or to even ask God help. Yeah. Ask God for help with your untrustworthy spirit because that's what it is. It's just the spirit. And we can ask for help in it because you cannot get help if you don't ask. Closed mouth don't get fed. Even though he knows what we need, he wants us to ask him. He wants us to request it. He wants us to know 
that, you know, we have a relationship with him. It's not one-sided. He wants to hear from us. He wants to hear what's on our heart. Even though he knows what's in our heart and our mind, he wants us to hear. He wants to say it out loud. He wants us to talk to him. We can have our, a question for our kids. We know the answer already, but we want them. We want to hear them say it, hear what they have to say, hear how they feel holy. So he wants the same thing from us. So he wants us his own Holy Spirit and go deeper to the root of why it's so hard for us to give him his all because it's definitely personal. It's not striving for perfection, but we should always have some progress. As long as we're moving forward, that's all he can ask of us. He don't require us to be perfect. He just requires some progress. Thank you. That is my lesson. Let's give the Lord a hand clap and pray. Come on, we can do better than that. She taught harder than y'all saying amen. What, what, what causes all this obedience? But what, what did Simon do? What did he really do? <clears throat> he died to himself. Obedience is dying to you, baby. It ain't your way. Christ died for it to be God's way. So you can't live and thank you for the help. The fight is you ain't died to you. You got to die to you, man. See, redemption doesn't happen to something dies. So you don't even have the redemptive power when you still think it's you. You got to die. I don't get the death benefit till she die. Oh. Your benefit don't come from God till you die. How you been doing it? I'm going to contradict everything you've done. That's why I came. You supposed to lose your mind when you look at you and go. Oh, you say I don't need that no more. When you use the word re, okay, re, renew, that means you get something back. Uh, rewind, you start over. The only word that's re, that's, that's new and by itself is redeem. You get a new page when you're redeemed. Not, not the old one brought back to you. It's a new page. So when you die, you get a new mindset. Uh-oh. You get a new spirit. You get a new way of thinking. Now the fight is you don't want to die. You still leaning, then that ain't gonna get you nothing. But the crap you've always had. Now, now how did God help you? Faith come by. He sent you me, baby. Whether you like it or not. He sent you a coach, whether you're in a 1K, 5K, 10K, 50K. The coach coaches you through your race. There's a hundred yard. There's a two hundred. Four hundred. Everybody ain't running all this. But the coach coach them all. But the coach coach them all. Because the coach coaches the principles. The coach coaches the fundamentals, yeah. the breathing, the working out, yeah. the not, you know, he coaches fundamental. Yeah. So whether you're a babe in Christ, you've been in Christ since Jesus left, the fundamentals is the fundamentals. Yeah. I've been listening to what you were teaching. I said, can you imagine, can you imagine, what time? Okay, okay, I got time. Can you imagine Peter on the boat in the water? There's no wall in the water. Now, now, I cast my net on this side, nothing. Because that's what I know to do. This is how I've been rolling. I always cast to the left. And that's how I feed the people. That's how I get the, that's how I get the, that's how I get the, 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 the fishing water. I'm a left caster. Oh, but get the mass overflow. You got to cast to the right, baby. And at the same time, that water has no wall in it. 
But yet when you cast what God tell you to cast, when you die to self, when you lean not to your own understanding, yeah, you done ate over here, but did you really eat? Yeah, you done lived over here, but did you really live? I got a new life for you. Die to yourself and do what I tell you. Oh. The struggle is in the middle. Don't double dutch with God, man. You better come on. Get in there. Get on in that thing, man. Go on, die. So you can live. That's where the legacy is passed on. Death comes. Uh oh. You gotta die, man. You gotta die. I don't care what you've been doing. That's the world system. I can't give you the overflow with that thinking. Some of your thinking sucks. That's why your life suck. So we have, we here, you come here to get your life to unsuck so you can reap. So you can reap what's yours. The hard reset. We've been here for two years on this planet. And you won't even reset. You won't hit the three at the same time. Because you stuck on the memories. You don't want no new ones. You won't clear up the space for the new. I got you on a new page. You think Fred's supposed to be there. Hell, it's a new page. He's the author. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He said, I ain't going to give you another page. I'm going to give you a new page. Hit the three buttons. How you been doing it? That ain't what that is. Can I prove it to you? What you got to prove it with? Nothing. It didn't work. And you arguing about something that didn't work. You got to die. Daily. Peter made a living fishing. So why would I change what works? I'm an experienced fisherman. I make a living doing this. You made a living, but I'm going to teach you significance. I'm going to teach you legacy. I'm going to take you deeper in me. Now I let you fish so you can understand what I really called you to do. You know how to fish for fish. The only way you're going to be fishing for me, you got to die to fishing, to, to fishing for fish. We've got to do something different and go deeper. Why did he let everybody else both get filled? Because there's so many lost souls out here, I'm going to turn more people on than I can. So more people are talking about me. You question God and he's been keeping you. You asked God for it. He did it. And you mad? Come on, dog. Come on. We all do it, but come on. So the coach says, now you know how to run, but you know that's the way you run. I ain't knocking you doing it. You know, it's a 5K. You give out at three. Because you're not listening. You ain't pacing your... Come on, y'all. Teach the lesson with me then. Quit acting like you don't know. And do what you know you're supposed to do. You say you accepted him as your personal savior? Act like it. Don't get in your feelings when the coach coaches. It's to make you better. Because when you better, the team better. We're only as strong as our weakest link. And if you're the weak one, I'm coming. Give a damn how long I've been knowing you, what we share in common. If you're the weak link and he showed me you, I'm coming. Because we can't get better if you ain't. That's what friends do. That's what coaches do. You don't want no weak coach. You want that coach that'll knock your head off. If you don't, don't, if you don't get your blanket and blanket up there, you get home talking about, oh, I can't stand him. And pray you, oh, I can't stand him. You go home talking about, boy, I sure love that dude, man. He, 
If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be. What, you, you know how it is, right? If it wasn't for him, I don't know what is, but it's got to be tough. Because that old stuff stick, man. That old mindset is stick. That, hey, I got some proof that they worked a little bit, but where God is taking me, that ain't going to even matter. Can just die. Yeah, yeah. See, you don't get the power of redemption till you die. That's, right. That's why you lean to your own understanding. You right. won't die. Right. That ain't how that is, Paul. Uh, doing that. Die for that. Yeah. So when you get to the other side, nigga, you can get what he got. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What you come to church for? Yeah. Yeah. What the hell you get up for? A lot of you sitting here dead because you don't have no, you don't even know why your eyes open. I read the book, then I'm finna go. Oh, yeah, we read the book, talking to the man, it says, he says, he says, he said, Daddy said, that son, come sit down, I want to talk to you. When you get up in the morning, when you get up, I want you to go to high school, go to college, get a good job, so you can have a house, raise your kids, teach your kids how to do the same thing. He said, but why? For what? What, what are we doing it for? Your son grow up, he do the same thing. For what? And nobody could answer the question. That's why the church is dead. You got up, went to school, got your job, paid your bills, can't take care of your kids, don't know what abundance is, just existing. And you're teaching your kids to that. Then your kids get mad, you get mad at your kids because they ain't listening to you no more because your life doesn't depict you no nothing. He said, I can't. That you may have and have it. Where is the more abundant? Yeah. Right, right. 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 See, when I buy a ticket on a plane, certain things I'm entitled to based on where I'm sitting. If I'm sitting in coach in the back, I'm gonna get. If you're on American Airlines, you are gonna get some of them old funny looking cookies and a drink, and you got to ask for the whole can. If I'm sitting in first class, you get the whole can, the whole bottle. <laughs> The food, the blanket, you get everything. But if you're at home, you don't get none of it. If you're on the bus, why are you here? Are you reaping the benefits of living? I ain't talking about your building. Are you reaping the benefits of living, God? Are you fishers of men? Can somebody look at you and desire to go at you, sir? boy said, you know what? He filled our boat too. Yeah. I'm going. You mean he ain't done enough to convince you to follow him? He, he ain't calling. He ain't done enough for you to say. So if he have, why you ain't You ain't died. You still trying to resurrect that old person. I, I was, girl, you can tell that was God. Because I talked about you in class. I said, you know what? Faith says move when you don't want to move. The Lord said, put her in class. She, did, she, did, she rejected it. 
No, I ain't doing that. I said, yes, you is. No, 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 Sister Collins. She said, I'm not doing that. I said, yes, she is. She said, I ain't never talked. I said, I got a plan for you. She said, okay, what's the plan? I'm going to put a Nietzsche in there with you. I told Nietzsche, don't you teach a lesson. Don't you teach one lesson. So that's what happened. I say, I say, I say, call up. I say, keep in the middle of the road. I'm going. Don't you say that. Stand up. She's in there, teacher. Who is that? Stand right here. Boy, come here, Kate. Come here, come here, Kate. So, so she, she, she's in there, teacher. This is Nietzsche. I ain't trying to be funny. This is Nietzsche. She teaching. Come here, Nietzsche. Come on, Nietzsche. And she never came back. What I had for her was the assistant superintendent. You can't be the assistant superintendent sitting in the class. But I got to put you in the class. You got to know she can do the class. And when I get a teaching, I'm going to let you go. So you can... Will y'all trust my job? Hey, 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 hey. I'm unorthodox, but trust it, okay? I, I got you. I, I, I promise you. I, I promise you. It's going to make sense. If you just listen and do what I tell you to do. Because yeah. my assignment, my, mm, my, what they call it, what they call it, the, 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 the thing you make every week? You, you, he wrote it. He wrote the plan. I'm just reading it to you. And, and, and I'm, the, I'm just making sure you engage on what he wrote. So you can get your message and get your promotion to go do what he called you to do. But we got to die first. Somebody say, I got to die. Say it like you mean it. Die then! And you know what? You know what? You know what? I was thinking about this. You, we hate to see people die. We hate to see loved ones die. But what we hate more than loved ones is ourselves. We hate to see that old man die so the new man could come and the world be blessed. Death, you get a life insurance policy, don't pay to somebody to die. So that's when the legacy be your legacy begins when you die to self. Because when he died to self, he made the book. Are you in the book? What book you in? If you still walk around here trying to live, you ain't made it yet. When you die to self, he puts you in there. And he stands you up. Making me use you. And people are getting, the, they'll know Christ because you live. Father God, we come to say thank you for this time. Thank you for our teacher. Thank you for reminding us that we must die to self. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Is all our baptism people here? Donna, your girl's here, right?